Hello, uh, welcome to curated tour, tour number three. I am Dr. Georgiana Sancho, curator at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum. And I have invited uh, um, Dr. Bradson Kroa uh, for another uh, tour uh, about uh, less known uh, operations in uh, Canadian military. And this time we are looking at the Battle of Mount Sorel uh, 2 to 13 June 1916. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a few things about the uh, Zoom protocol. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, keep them to the end and uh, put them in the chat box. Um, you are muted and the cameras are turned off. The meeting is recorded. And uh, today, uh, most particularly, I am going to uh, adopt a slightly different format. We will start in the gallery in the section uh, dedicated to the First World War. And then I will hand it over to Dr. Sen Kwa to uh, talk to us about the Battle of Mount Sorel. Uh, meanwhile, I am going uh, to our reception area where uh, you will be able to view a very special artifact, namely uh, the uh, cross from Flanders Fields. So uh, let's start. Uh, first, uh, let me mute my, uh, turn my camera. I am here in the First World War section of the museum. And uh, just to say that uh, unlike uh, many other units, the Royal Canadian Regiment did not sail overseas in August 1914. Um, they did sail overseas though, not in Europe. They sailed to Bermuda to take over garrison duty for the British regiment who had been called to arms. And in this little uh, corner of our gallery, I'm going to point out not only this image of the uh, machine gun section in Bermuda, but also uh, some training that was happening in the summer of 1914. Uh, this is in uh, Niagara, at Niagara camp. And also a little lower, uh, machine gun training in Bermuda. And just for uh, uh, an idea of the proportion, the strength of Canadian army at the uh, outbreak of the uh, First World War, the uh, top uh, image depicts uh, the Cape Camp Petiwawa um, a training camp in 1912. And uh, those are most of the companies of the Royal Canadian Regiment, which was uh, the only infantry regiment with a permanent force in Canada at the time. So the uh, Canadian uh, military infantry was uh, about that size when the First World War broke out. And another item uh, of interest in this display case is this little cane a souvenir cane uh, that has uh, uh, an engraving of the, uh, the acronym GPOW for German Prisoner of War. So the RCR in Bermuda was um, uh, performing garrison duties and uh, guarding uh, German prisoners of war. They were not uh, as much military as they were uh, merchant navy um, uh, German uh, merchant navy uh, captured uh, uh, while uh, traveling uh, across the Atlantic uh, from America. And they were uh, brought in Bermuda and uh, they spent their time creating this type of uh, souvenirs. Some of them were selling them to the American tourists, but this one particularly was purchased by one of the RCR members. And now uh, just uh, very quickly, let's move to the section dedicated to the uh, Battle of Mount Sorel, only to view the general layout. And here we are. You can see here uh, a little write-up about the Battle of Mount Sorel uh, between uh, 
between the 2nd and the 13th of June 1916. And I will not go into too much detail, uh, just to say that um, uh, the, uh, the RCR had joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force uh, on the Western Front, the 3rd uh, Canadian Division, 7th Infantry Brigade. And uh, their first commit, their first uh, battle engagement uh, happened in June 1916. Uh, the Second British Army continued to uh, defend uh, the uh, town of Ypres while uh, Germany attacked in an attempt to force the British into transferring troops um, from a, uh, from a, another area at the Somme. Uh, the uh, Battle of Mount Sorel is little known and uh, um, less popular than many other battles during the First World War. Uh, little ground was gained or lost, yet both sides suffered tremendous casualties. The uh, Third Canadian Division endured heavy casualties, including their commander. The RCR alone reported 157 killed missing in action or wounded. And the number represents one in four men lost um, out of the regiment's troops uh, engaged in combat at that time. What is important about the uh, Battle of Mount Sorel is that the British Army headquarters acknowledged the leadership of Canadian Army, Canadian, Canadian Army officers, uh, their knowledge of warfare. And additionally, the ineffective Ross rifles and the Colt machine guns were replaced with the Lee Enfield. And here we have a sample of the Ross rifle. Uh, the infamous uh, Ross rifle that uh, was used in the early years of uh, of the uh, First World War by Canadians. It was a straight pull bolt action rifle uh, known for accuracy and high rate of fire. Uh, while very appropriate, appropriate for hunting and target shooting, it was not sustainable in the trenches because dirt, mud and poor quality ammunition would cause the weapon to jam. Additionally, it was not robust enough, it was not robust and couldn't handle bayonet fighting. And Canadian soldiers often complained about the rifle and discarded them in favor of the British made Lee Enfield. And uh, right now, uh, I am going to head uh, down in the reception area to um, be close to the uh, other artifact. And I would like to invite uh, Dr. St. Croix uh, to begin his uh, intervention today. Sorry, I'm uh, here putting my video. All right. Can we see you? I can't find a way to put my video back on. Oh, sorry, wrong button. There we go. Okay, there we are. Thank okay. you. So again, uh, uh, go ahead, Brad. See you in a moment. Yeah. So, so thanks everyone for coming and watching us today and those watching in the future. Uh, so for what I'm going to talk about is just give more general overview of the battle of Montserrat and kind of what happened. Uh, the one big takeaway from this is that it was a very seesaw battle. It wasn't, um, it wasn't static by any means for the two or so weeks that it took place. So after the fighting at St. Alois in France in April 1916, the commander of the Canadian Corps was replaced uh, by General Julian Bing, who's one of the, that is the one, alongside with Curry, is the other famously known commander of the Canadian Corps. Uh, and they liked him so much, they called themselves the Bing Boys. Uh, then this battle was his first major test as commander of the Corps. So the Corps itself had moved back into Belgium and to the Eve Salient uh, after the fighting had died down at St. Elwha. Uh, so the Canadian held check, uh, section of the front line of the Allied position in the salient uh, at a high ground, which was quite rare, A, for the salient period, but also for the Allies to hold. That was very rare. Uh, so the line ran through uh, Hoge to Sanctuary Wood down to Hill 62, uh, and another feature called Tortop, 
and then on to Hill 61 and Mount Sorrel itself. Uh, this position was actually a, a mini salient on its own uh, that struck into German lines. So you have a salient within a salient. Um, and also what is an important feature of this is the Canadian lines overlooked the German trenches. Again, a rare a rarity, uh, particularly for the British and French armies, but uh, particularly here, that was something that rarely happened. Uh, so uh, obviously this was something very unfavorable to the Germans and they wanted to remove the Canadians from these high ground positions. So the 27th and 26th divisions of the 13th uh, Wurttemberg Corps is, what, is the German uh, units that attacked the Canadian 3rd Division uh, beginning on June the 2nd. Uh, at six o'clock in the morning, uh, the, the positions were hit by a heavy and stress heavy German preparatory artillery bombardment. Uh, it was the hardest one that the Canadians had seen to this point and came to foreshadow the bombardments that would become to seen on the Somme uh, later on that summer and on through the rest of the war. Uh, it, it also, as um, Dr. Sanchi had already mentioned, uh, the Canadian commander, um, oh, sorry, not the Canadian commander, the commander of the 3rd Division was actually killed uh, during this preparatory bombardment. Uh, General uh, Malcolm Mercer was up at the front lines uh, along with the brigade commander uh, to to do a reconnaissance of of actually of uh, Tortop and Mount Sorrel itself to kind of see the positions and what they were um, going to do to kind of hold the position as best as possible. Uh, but that's exactly when the bombardment opened up, uh, and he was killed, and the brigade commander was wounded. So this lack of leadership caused lots of confusion throughout the Canadian lines, uh, but also when the higher ups on what to do and where to move units once they started to fall back against the German attack. Um, the, again, I can't stress enough how intense this bombardment was. It stuck in the minds of many of the veterans, um, especially those who survived the whole war. They said this was one of the worst, if not the worst. Uh, the trenches were completely, the Canadian trenches were completely smashed, um, unrecognizable. Soldiers were buried in them, buried in the tunnels that had been dug, uh, and it was very difficult to get a lot of them out, and a lot of them were taken prisoner or killed. Uh, in the fighting. Uh, so there was a German eyewitness uh, for this and they described what they saw. So, and I quote, the whole enemy position was a cloud of dust and dirt into which timber, tree trunks, weapons and equipment were continuously hurled up and occasionally human bodies. So even this bombardment stuck in the minds of the Germans. So just before beginning their advance, um, the Germans detonated four mines just in front of the Canadian positions. Uh, this allowed the Germans to continue to take, take advantage of the confusion and they took their objectives. They moved through the Canadian lines, um, not extremely easily, but enough uh, to be able to take up the positions that they had been tasked with doing and, and to start to dig in. Um, so a counterattack was ordered pretty much right away uh, as, long, as soon as they understand what was happening at the higher levels, uh, even up to, uh, up to General Haig. Uh, so uh, the third division, were of, there we go. So these were of limited um, uh, success. Um, again, being attacking in the daylight, not having proper preparation. Uh, they took lots of uh, casualties, but they did gain some ground, but not very much. Uh, so they dug in, held their positions and had to plan what to do uh, next. Uh, so they were gonna take some time to do that. Uh, and also weather caused delays um, due to things that meaning like, um, Aircraft observation uh, kept the planes grounded, so the attack kept getting pushed back. Uh, it was supposed to be launched on the 6th, but that didn't happen. Uh, what did happen, though, is the Germans attacked again uh, further to the north. They launched uh, another attack uh, preceded by blowing of mines uh, again, but this one was held off better than the initial German attack. Um, again, having time to kind of get their bearings and know what was coming. Uh, so the preparations for the major Canadian counterattack uh, went on. Uh, this one was going to rely heavily on artillery, having learned the lesson that, of that just happened, what the Germans had done uh, to initially start the attack. So they brought in lots of artillery assets. Uh, and again, as Dr. Sanchute had mentioned, uh, there was an attempt uh, to uh, disrupt reinforcements for the Somme. Uh, but uh, Hag, the commander of the BEF, uh, didn't take the bait uh, and wanted just only artillery assets to be given to to. Uh, to help this counterattack. Uh, so as part of the plan and, and what they wanted to do was to throw the Germans off and pour us confusion. So they would do multiple times, uh, four in total, was intense uh, bombardments of 20 to 30 minutes 
to try and catch the Germans off guard and think that the next attack was coming, but then they would launch no attack. Uh, this went on for days between the 9th and the 12th, uh, just to kind of keep them on their toes. Uh, but on the 12th, um, that's when the real assault started to begin. This is when a 10 hour barrage was launched off and on all day long, really pummeling the German positions. Um, and then at uh, and then the attack began technically the next day at 1.30 a.m., um, which included the uh, 1st Battalion, uh, which is now perpetuated by the Royal Canadian Regiment. Uh, this attack was far more successful than the original Canadian counterattack launched in the immediate uh, aftermath. Uh, the German defenders, much like the Canadians days prior, were stunned by the ferocity of the barrage. A lot of them offered little resistance. Um, there was isolated machine gun positions that offered resistance, but those were overcome in most positions. Um, but those who were stunned by this either surrendered or fell back to the German uh, front line that had existed on the second. Uh, so the Germans worked, sorry, the Canadians uh, pushed forward, uh, took their original positions back and worked to consolidate, the, consolidate them and prepare for another counterattack because that is what German doctrine was in the war, was to counterattack as immediately as possible to stop um, the enemy, to take the land back that the enemy had just gained. Uh, these happened, uh, there's a few of them, three, I believe, uh, sporadic, uh, but these were very much easily broken up by all those additional artillery assets that had been brought in uh, to support the initial counterattack. So between the 2nd and 14th of June, the Canadian Corps losses uh, numbered approximately 8,000 casualties, that's killed and wounded and prisoners. Uh, and in the same time period, the Germans lost around uh, 5,800 casualties, again, killed, wounded, and taken prisoner. Uh, as Dr. Stanchu had already mentioned, very little else changed. Um, so besides being thousands of casualties on both sides, uh, the front line hardly moved. Um, at the end of all of the, when the fighting died down, the front lines were still within 150 yards of each other in pretty much the same positions they were on the second before the attack began. Uh, this was uh, another one, again, that did nothing more than just cause loss of life. Uh, and then once the Canadians had consolidated uh, and the German counterattacks were broken up, the Germans stopped trying to uh, attack and take the position back. Uh, now, just a quick aside I wanted to finish on uh, about why this was another interesting one, is this location, specifically Hill 62, I don't know how many of you have visited there, it's not a large position, but in Flanders, it makes a difference. Uh, initially, that was going to be the location of the National Memorial for the war, not Vimy Ridge, Hill 62. Uh, that was changed pretty much at the last minute. Um, I've seen the contract myself. It's literally hand-crossed out, written in pencil, changing it to Vimy. Uh, so I think that's an interesting thing to, to, to remember about this battle is it's not as very well known, possibly because of it didn't do much. But at the time, it was seemingly enough to stand for the entire sacrifice of the Canadian war effort in the First World War. So I just think that's an interesting kind of note to leave off on uh, about the whole fighting that took place at Mount Sorel, Hill 62, and, and all the fighting that took place in the early summer of 1916. Thank you, uh, Brad, for uh, leaving it on this note. It is indeed interesting to, to note that uh, the Vimy National Memorial was supposed to be uh, on Hill 62. Uh, you have uh, uh, here on the screen the um, uh, grave marker uh, from uh, Battle of Mount Sorel for uh, the casualties, some of the casualties uh, of the Royal Canadian Regiment. And uh, this uh, item was uh, brought to Walsley Barracks uh, for the Royal Canadian Regiment in July 1930. It was um, at the end of the uh, works of the um, uh, um, Commonwealth War Grave Commission, uh, when uh, after they have finished uh, setting all the gravestones and uh, sorting out uh, the plots, etc. And um, uh, the grave markers were sent to the units. So this uh, particular one came here uh, to uh, London uh, at Wolseley Barracks. And I'm going to go a little closer, just so uh, you can see, uh, just so you can see uh, the uh, cross a little closer. It is, uh, a cross with uh, 
uh, name plates marked and of the uh, uh, the initially 22 uh, only 20 uh, are left on the uh, on the cross uh, one of them uh, was uh, found uh, fortunately had not been killed and uh, another one uh, i can't remember exactly the reason why he was not uh, uh, left on the the marker and uh, here we are all those uh, uh, marked on the cross they were between 18 and 42 years old you probably can also see a little bit of a map behind the cross. Uh, and uh, uh, Brad has just uh, sort of explained the, uh, the area. So that map is not a, um, uh, an accident, is not a random uh, graphic that we chosen. It's a map of uh, the, uh, the, the battle area. And you can see sanctuary wood and observatory road where the, uh, uh, the engagement was uh, ferocious. Uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment was active in the area village of Hoog where uh, we had the uh, railway uh, um, traffic uh, that they needed to take care of. And uh, finally, this um, little uh, exhibit has a uh, touch screen digital uh, interactive uh, interpretation and i hope it will work i'm not sure okay it does and uh, you can explore here more about uh, the battle and how uh, things uh, uh, evolved uh, during the early weeks of uh, june 1916. now um i have one favorite set of um, images I would like to show you. I hope they can be seen. All right, so uh, this, these are, um, uh, it's a farm, uh, valley cottages where uh, the RCR was billeted uh, before the battle. The next one is an image of the battlefront from uh, Library and Archives Canada. And this is a, an image in, in a manuscript that I'm going to show you right away, uh, Sanctuary Wood uh, after uh, the engagement. And uh, probably uh, people are more familiar with uh, A.Y. Jackson uh, paintings and uh, his inspiration of this uh, remains of uh, woods throughout the uh, uh, landscape of remains of woods throughout the uh, uh, Belgium and Flanders. And uh, another image after the devastation of the um, artillery bar barrage. And here is um, the battle site today. As you can see, the towers uh, in the foreground are uh, uh, in the background. They are uh, from the Ypres Cathedral. So it's really not that far from Ypres. And here, even closer. And this is uh, another map of the uh, Battle of uh, Mount Sorel. Canadian Corps approximate situation on the evening of 9th June 1916. And now one last uh, item that I would like to uh, show to our uh, attendants today. Let me bring the camera to the... All right. Here, this is a uh, typed manuscript that was put together by, um, at the time, Major Harry Tridenic Cock. He was uh, eventually regimental major, and uh, in that capacity, uh, he did write a um, short history of the Royal Canadian Regiment. Himself, he was part of the regiment during the Battle of uh, Mount Sorel. He was um, uh, with the uh, machine gun section, as you can see it here in this photo. Sorry, I am hoping to put it straight. Yes, uh, 
Uh, and this photo was taken in March 1916, so just a month before the Battle of Mount Sorel. Now, uh, let me move on to the pages where he describes the Battle of Mount Sorel, and we are not going to start reading it, but uh, go through the images and you will see again, Uh, various uh, photographs during uh, June 1916 and uh, before that, actually. This is a uh, billet uh, for machine gun section in at Christmas 1915. And over here, we have the image that we've seen already in our interactive uh, touch screen. Valley Cottage, Valley Cottage's uh, farm in Ypres at 1916. And it is nice to look at this trench cap 1915. It's a drawing, it's a hand drawing in ink. Uh, and yes, we move on to this images, trench in sanctuary wood in 1916. We don't know whether uh, the soldiers that are laying down are uh, casualties or they're just uh, resting. Also, uh, Sir Julian Visset being a, Sir Julian Visset being, sorry, Field Marshal Sir Julian Visset being here. And One of the paintings that was inspired by um, the engagement at uh, Mount Sorel Sanctuary Wood uh, is in that area. And as uh, um, Dr. St. Croix already mentioned, it was in, uh, at the time, it was in the minds of the contemporaries. It was a, uh, the devastation of that battle had taken the toll. And I think uh, we can uh, wrap it up with this and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. We hope uh, that uh, you will be able to join us uh, later this year. Uh, actually, we, we are planning to have another curated tour uh, before 10 July. Uh, perhaps uh, 5th of July, I believe, on the uh, uh, Second World War this time, uh, Operation Husky, which is equally an, an operation equally unpromoted, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, very important for uh, what happened in the Second World War. Um, then uh, maybe we will meet in October. Uh, monitor our social media and website for uh, more updates and uh, the exact date of the uh, next curated tour. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy uh, the sun and uh, have a great summer. Bye, everybody.